All right. So happy Hanukkah, everybody. Let's join together. If you have a Hanukkah in front of you, I invite you to light the shamash. We'll wait a second till they're all lit. And we'll join together in these brachot and then sing Ma'ud Sur together. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kidshanu B'mitzvotav V'tzivanu Lehadikner Shel Chanukah Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam, she'asa nisim lavoteinu, bayamim ha'hem, bahazman ha'zem. Ma'oz zur yeshuati, Lecha nahe lishabeha Tikon bete filati Visham toda nezabeha Lietachim adbeha Mitzar ham nabeha Azeg mor vishir mizmor Chanu kata mizbeach, azeg mor b'shir mizmor. Chanu kata mizbeach, rock of ages, let our songs praise your saving power. You amidst the raging foes. Were our sheltering tower. Furious they assailed us, but your arm availed us, and your word broke their sword when our own strength failed us, and your word broke their sword. When our own strength failed us. Thank you, Rabbi. Uh, happy Hanukkah, everyone. It's good to see all of you. Um, I was just writing a letter to the congregation this afternoon that um, we did Passover on Zoom beautifully with Haggadahs and song. And uh, Shabbat has been very special each and every week we really gather in record numbers. The high holy days went off without a hitch and Hanukkah has been beautiful as we've gathered each night. Um, the question is Christmas, what are we gonna do? Because you can't go to the movies or in a, to a Chinese restaurant. So this is really the great struggle for all of us. So if you have any ideas, but what we have planned is Christmas Eve, we are going to join in on a Jewish comedian, uh, Joel Chasnoff, who is very funny and actually is, was Rabbi Sherman's counselor. And he's doing a concert so we can all sign into his concert. And then on Friday, which is Christmas Day, uh, we are going to have a collective pickup for Chinese food at the temple. So uh, you can eat your Chinese during Shabbat services on Friday night. What could be better? So um, we're gonna we're gonna make it through Christmas as well together. So uh, this is the seventh night of Hanukkah. Each night has been uh, a different experience, but it's been nice to share this uh, holiday, even in isolation, to see each other. This the seventh night. We thought we would share a little Torah. Uh, for about a half an hour, study a little bit about Hanukkah from the Talmud. And then tomorrow night, I think it's at seven o'clock. Yes, seven o'clock is a concert with Cantor Zell, Cantor Suffren, and friends to, to end the holiday in song. So um, 
Wanted to take a look at the Hanukkah menorah and its lighting. Many of you know the famous story about how we light the candles. It comes from the Talmud that there's a debate between Hillel and Shammai. Now, Hillel and Shammai debated everything. They constantly disagreed. And of course, they disagreed on the Hanukkah lighting as well. Hillel argued uh, that we should light the candles, one light on the first night two, night, two lights on the second, three lights on the third. But Shammai actually said, no, it should be eight lights on the first night, seven lights on the second night, and six lights on the third night, and on and on. And they said, Shammai, why would you want to do that? And he said, well, that's what happens with the oil. There was a lot of oil the first night, and then there was a little less, and there was a little less, and there was a little less. And that's watching the miracle of oil, that it stays lit, despite there's a little less. Of course, he, he made that rational argument, but he lost. Um, Hillel wins, and we know that, because we light one light, and tonight we're lighting seven, and tomorrow we'll light eight. And why does Hillel win? Well, according to the rabbis, um, we should always increase light. Um, we should always look forward that tomorrow can be brighter than today. And that's our Karen practice. So that's a familiar story, but it doesn't really answer some of the other specifics of the candle lighting. For instance, why we move from right to left and left to right, and um, some of the different viewpoints on the candle lighting. So I thought that's what we would look at in the Talmud tonight. Um, you may ask why we start on the right side and not on the left side. When we light the candles, we put the first night in on the right side. There's really no definitive answer at all, which is very Jewish. So we can come up with lots of reasons. Most likely, in my opinion, the scientific critical reason, which is not like you know the stories of the rabbis, is um, the, in the rabbinic world, they privileged the right side. Um, in fact, some people, even two generations ago, if you were a lefty, they turned you into a righty. I don't know if anyone had that happen to them as a child. It's just easier to make everyone a righty. Why should everyone be a righty? I have no idea, but they made everyone a righty. Um, and, and it's true in the biblical period, the right hand often represents strength. But then the question is, okay, so it makes sense that we put the candle starting on the right side for your right hand, but why do we start on the left side in the lighting? And once again, there's no definitive answer. So one, one could say, kind of the rationalist, one of the reasons is when you, when you light the left candle first, which is our current practice, you don't block the light. You're not crossing uh, flames. You're doing one, then you go to the next one. It's actually a safer way of lighting. Um, but of course, that's not good for rabbis who like you know midrash and stories and meaning. And so they often say, you know, we should start with the newest light um, as a reminder of the the creativity and the miraculousness of what can take place today. But what I'd like to do is with Rabbi Sherman jumping in whenever he'd like, um, it's easy for me to kind of on Zoom, just uh, take hold of the mic, but unmute yourself as you'd like. And we're a nice number this evening. Actually, we've grown to be able to kind of unmute um, and chime in if you'd like. Just uh, if you do unmute, remember to mute yourself back again, please. Um, for a variety of reasons um, to save embarrassment at times. But um, I'd love to look at beginning with the Mishnah Torah, uh, which is Maimonides, which it comes after the Talmud. One who held the lamp in his hand and stands has not done anything. For the viewer will say he is standing for his needs. So what I'd like to begin with is the rabbis start to ask, um, not just the order of the candle lighting, 
But how, in fact, we're lighting the candles? Do we fulfill the mitzvah by lighting it in any way we'd like? And they say, no. One who holds the lamp in his hands, the menorah, and stands hasn't done anything. For the viewer will say he is standing for his needs. So any thoughts on this? If you ever think about it, you light the candles and you stand there and you hold the menorah. The rabbis say, not enough. Any thoughts? When we do screen share, I can only see a couple people at a time. So I don't know if anyone wants to, oh, thanks rabbi. You light the menorah, you say the prayers and you stand there. So the rabbis have a problem with this. They say the mitzvah of the lighting of the menorah is not just to remember the miracles, but it is to publicize the miracles. The mitzvah is to proclaim out loud the miracles. So by standing there, you're holding it to yourself. You're not sharing it with others. So let's take a look at the, the next line of Mishnah Torah. The mitzvah of the Hanukkah candle is an extremely precious one. And one must be careful with it to publicize the miracle, to announce the miracle. So that's what Hanukkah is about. It's not just lighting the candles and remembering the cruise of oil that lasted for eight days, but it's about publicizing the actual miracle. Next, let's scroll down to where. Is that- I suppose the, go, go ahead. Put it in the window. Exactly. So any way we can publicize the mitzvah. So the best way is to put it in the window so your neighbors can see it. That's a great segue. So let's take a look. The sages taught in a bright that it is a mitzvah to place the Hanukkah lamp at the entrance to one's house on the outside so that all can see it. So in Israel, actually, by your mailbox, if it's kind of on the street, very often you'll see a glass box and that's where you place your menorah. It's an oil lamp, usually, sometimes candles, and you literally place it outside in a glass box at the entrance to one's house. But if one lived upstairs, they place it at the window adjacent to the public domain. And in a time of danger, when the Gentiles issued decrees to prohibit kindling lights, they place it on the table and that is sufficient to fulfill their obligation. So thoughts as we take this down, I'd love to see people, Rabbi. Publicizing the mitzvah. Marsha? Oops, you're muted. I'm wondering whether part of this is that we're providing, that these candles provide light in the darkness. When people were scared that they would be eliminated, the light was there for the eight days. So maybe by putting it in our window, we're lighting the way during dark nights for others or representing that in some ways. Um, but we have to be careful and also take care of ourselves and um, therefore the table. But I like the idea that it's a dark night. Nowadays, it's a dark night for many people. And if we can provide some lightness in that window, then I think we're doing something on Hanukkah. Yeah, that's nice. Don't keep it to yourself. Rabbi? Please. Rabbi, didn't the Sephardic put it in a closet so they couldn't be seen? Yes, I think what you're referring to is the Muranos. Yep. The Sephardic Jews who fled Spain. Right to hide their Judaism. Very often we have stories in Spain today or even in New Mexico where someone will say, my grandmother, you know, we have no Jewish lineage, but my grandmother would light candles in her closet. 
um, sometimes on every Friday night. I can't understand it. Or, you know, once a year around December. Um, and so, yes, um, Jews went into hiding. And this was a case where it was clearly permissible. I find what's most interesting to me about these texts so far is that it says that when we light these candles, they can be quite beautiful, especially towards the end of the holiday. But it's almost like if you're looking at them with beauty, then we're actually not, it seems like we're doing it wrong. Um, and, and it makes me sort of wonder, um, we're not lighting them for ourselves, for the beauty of them. We're lighting them for others. For others. Nice. That's a nice read. Other Jerry? Oh, can I add something? Um, when we were on the temple trip to Spain and we're in Toledo, several of our group were brought below an antique store down into a basement that was a hideout for Jews uh, at the time of when Jews were not recognized in Spain exactly. and prominent down there was a menorah. Yeah. So it goes back to what Judith was saying about Sephardic Jews had to hide and hid the menorah. And the man told us a story about why the menorah was there as well as other artifacts. For what it's worth, the Mishnah Torah, oh, that was actually came from the Talmud. I was gonna say the first two texts came from the Rambam who lived there, right. Maimonides. Can I ask a picky, picky question here? <laughs> I was always told that this was called the Hanukkah because it has nine branches and the menorah is really the seven branch. The menorah, you're, you're correct. Menorah means lamp. So it right. Can, it was what lit the temple originally, right? Any lamp, but a Hanukkah is a Hanukkah lamp. Right. Could be any lamp, although when we think of menorah, we think of the biblical menorah, which was in the temple, and it was the seven branches, which is more common. The Hanukkah is eight branched. Um, that's from the book of Maccabees, um, the eight branches, not really from the eight days of the oil. Um, I don't want to teach this separate class. But the, the oil is actually a later addition. And this is where I can shatter your faith. It probably didn't happen at all. Um, so the book of Maccabees uh, goes back. We're talking about Hanukkah exactly, Nancy. I'm sorry. Um, so the book of Maccabees, these events are from 167 BCE. But the cruise of oil only appears 600 years later. It's very rare to have historical events and then learn 600 years after the fact, the key miraculous moment of the events. So it would be like in 400 years, learning the most important thing about the Revolutionary War that happened. Um, that's how much time passed between the events of Hanukkah and the miracle of oil. In the book of Maccabees, though, we do have eight spears that are placed in the temple. And we also know that they missed the eight-day festival of Sukkot because of the battle. So that after the battle, they celebrated for eight days and they had eight spears lit. The rabbis of the Talmud, 600 years later, don't love that story because it glamorizes the military victory of human beings. And they want to focus on a different verse in the Bible, which is a very rabbinic verse, which is not by might nor by power, but by spirit alone. And the Maccabees book, which doesn't make the Bible, it doesn't get canonized. It's in known, it's in something called the Apocrypha. It's in the additional books. We don't even have the book of Maccabees in our Bible. So the, the rabbis are not by spirit, not by power. And then they're reading the book of Maccabees and saying, wait a minute, that's all about power. We don't like that. We're by spirit. In the book of Zechariah, it's not by might, not by power, but by spirit 
alone. So they really want to say it's by spirit alone. We're not militaristic. We're about God. We need a new hero with a story. The story shouldn't be Judah Maccabee fighting. The story should be God. It should be something supernatural. And thus the focus on the cruise of oil, um, which is a supernatural miracle. So it makes sense. But um, it's interesting how we see the development over time. But this menorah it probably was the representation of the nation as in the Bible. And then it develops into these eight branches, four on each side. Um, what we have today, the Hanukkah menorah. So unless there are any other questions or comments, we have this notion that this Hanukkah menorah can't be held up alone. It has to be displayed. And as Rabbi um, Sherman said, there's something perhaps a little selfish about just enjoying it for oneself. I guess, Rabbi Sherman, why should we just experience joy? We should have a little guilt along with it. Is that Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so Jewish, so Jewish. All right. That's so self-indulgent. Yeah. Here's my favorite one. Ah, you, you take this one then. So this one is really interesting to me. It's one line. The mitzvah of kindling the Hanukkah lights is from sunset until traffic in the marketplace ceases. So that is to say, what is that saying? The when, when do when? we? When do we light candles? Whenever we remember, no, well, whenever we can. In the early hours of the evening. Right, because if you're lighting it and nobody's outside, then you're just doing it for yourself, which seems to be not fulfilling the, oblig the actual obligation of the mitzvah of lighting the Hanukkah menorahs because they're not for ourselves, they're for other people. Which is also why some, some communities have customs of lighting Hanukkah candles in the morning during, during morning services as well. You'll see them lit there in order to publicize the miracle to make sure that people can see it. Just lichot's late at night, kol nidre, we can get it nine or 7.30, you get to take a choice but the Hanukkah lights come a little earlier. Um, and most people do that unless you forget. Um, and in truth, you're allowed to do it. So there are halachic rules about what if you forget, can you say it after? And they, uh, most rabbinic opinions, why I know this, I have no idea, is, um, when people go to bed in your house, you really shouldn't do it anymore. And I think that's like, that's just, okay, you can't publicize it to the neighbors who are, they're no longer walking around. But if your own family's asleep, like there's gotta be a limit somewhere. Um, that's really not advertising the miracle. So uh, if you forget, you can do it late, but if people are asleep, I think you lost your opportunity. That too, Danny. Also fire. <laughs> Say that again, Rabbi. Danny wrote. Danny wrote in the chat box. Also fire. Oh. <laughs> you wanna, if you want to hear a story about why Hanukkah should be a holiday of fire safety, you can go back and watch my uh, my moth hour story time from the um, from the um, the dreidel dash from last year remember that well we'll have to have a reprise i do want to say in modern israel before hanukkah they do make national announcements because there are always fires in people's homes the good news is that the homes are largely made of stone um at the same time you can imagine when the whole country is leaving candles lit it's not always the best thing in terms of public safety. So we have the way to light the candles from right to left, but we light them from left to right. We go one, two, three, four, five. We don't hold them to ourselves. We, we should display them in a way that people see them. We shouldn't just display them, but we should make sure we light them at a time when people are around to notice the miracle that occurred. And now I really want to focus on what is the miracle? Um, so let's take a look at Brachot, another Talmud text. And let's, we can do with this in English. The first one or the second one? 
let's do um that one looks good okay That's all right, this is a little lengthy. You wanna read it, Rabbi Sherman? Sure. For a miracle that occurs for the multitudes, we recite a blessing, but for a miracle that befalls an individual person, do we not recite a blessing? Wasn't there an incident where a certain man was walking alongside, uh, along the right side of the Euphrates River when a lion attacked him? A miracle was performed for him and he was rescued. He came before Rava, who said to him, every time that you arrive there to the site of the miracle, recite a blessing. Blessed are you who performed a miracle for me in this place. And once when Mar, son of Ravina, was walking in the valley of the willows and was thirsty for water, a miracle was performed for him and a spring of water was created for him and he drank. Furthermore, once, when Mar, son of Ravina, was walking in the marketplace of Mechuzah, and a wild camel attacked him. The wall cracked open, and he went inside it, and he was rescued. Ever since, when he came to the reeds, he recited, Blessed are you who performed a miracle for me in the reeds and with the camel. And when he came to the marketplace of Mechuzah, he recited, Blessed are you who performed a miracle for me with the camel and the reeds indicating that one who recites a blessing even for a miracle that occurs to an individual. The sages say, on a miracle performed on behalf of the multitudes, everyone is obligated to recite a blessing. On a, on a miracle performed on behalf of an individual, only the individual is obligated to recite a blessing. All right, so before we dig into this text, there's a lot here, but let's take this down so we can see each other. Any thoughts initially on this text, what's going on here? It's a little confusing. We can unpack this together. So, if not, we see. Rabbi, that, I just have yeah. a thought. Yeah. If, if a person, a miracle is um, done for one person, and a mother sees it, she'll also do a blessing. So that messes that up, and I'm sure a father too, and so on. So I understand it's the broad picture, but it just that's why it doesn't make sense. The kind of, why would the mother and father say it too? They'd be so blessed that they felt that their child was saved. So, so grateful yes. that they would recite a blessing. Yes. Exactly. So I guess the question becomes, when do you recite a blessing? For before, a people? before or after? I'm sorry, interrupted. No, I, I, I'm I open to it. I think kind of like, I guess the first question I would ask is, if, if that's the statement to recite a blessing upon a miracle, mm -hmm. then what is a miracle? Meaning what merits the recitation of a blessing? Mm -hmm. So when we have something that occurs for the multitudes, there might be sense, some sense of collective will and agreement that the community has to kind of agree on what's worthy of a joint blessing. So we do have in our prayer book, a special blessing for Hanukkah. We also have one for the creation of the state of Israel. So the Jewish communities kind of agreed that these are that was a modern day miracle, the state of Israel. Hanukkah was a, a miracle. But now how about when you're, you yourself, what are you saying a blessing for? So what are the examples here? Clearly, if you get attacked by a wild camel and you survive, that's you should say a blessing at each and every one of you. Know. Let's bring back the text to take a look. Yeah, they seem life-threatening. <laughs> exactly, you got it. So if you survive something life-threatening, a lion attacks and you survive, that's worthy of a blessing. But it's more than surviving. Let's take a look at the second one. You're walking in the willows. I'm sorry, I have this one, the second example. You're walking in the willows and you're thirsty for water and a spring of water was created for you. 
It's more than just surviving. So I'm going to argue, let's take this off if we want. It's not just about survival, but it's when something happens that's completely unexpected. Meaning if you're in the desert and you know that there's an oasis and you almost died, but you made it to the oasis, that's probably not a miracle. What's that? Good You're, luck. What's that? Good luck. Maybe it's good luck. Or perseverance. Perseverance, fortitude. You know, there's that fine line of, in our congregation of Shehechianu moments. I'll say a God-given moment versus a human ability. And sometimes it's hard to know. Some kids get into college because they deserved it. But I recognize that for some parents, they, they think it's completely undeserved and unexpected. They I have a question about this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a modern day question. Remember when the plane landed on the Hudson River with yeah, Sully? Well, Sully? Right. All right. So one of the women who was on the plane in an interview that happened soon after uh, said she she's from New York and she walks along the river. And every time she comes to that spot, she says a prayer because it was a miracle that happened. Is that a blessing or is that a prayer or is that, what is that? I'm going to argue all of the above. <laughs> the question is, is she thanking Sully? My guess is no. It's about, she probably had a moment in the plane where she said to herself, I'm not going to survive this. I'm going to die. This is it. I'm going to die. And then something happened and she woke up and someone was pulling her out of the water or something. And that's unexpected. Nancy. So are you saying that when something so great happens and it's unexpected, the normal reaction would, would be to be so overcome with gratitude because you didn't expect it, that you see it as a miracle. So there's something about you, the blessing almost pours out of you because you're so overcome. Yeah, I think so. Now, this is Joel speaking. But gratitude is from the word, from the Latin gratis, free. It's when you didn't get, put anything in to deserve it, but you get something for free. To me, you just don't. Yeah. Is that why we say thank God for even the littlest thing? Well, that's where we, yeah. I'd like to think so. So let's look at other texts because I think that's the source of gratitude. I think Danny wanted to. Oh, Danny, please. I just wanted to highlight, I think the, the question of what is a miracle is interesting and what we acknowledge. But the text is really interesting too, and I realize it's just a snippet, but um, the text points not to the, and I'm thinking about prayer, not the prayer or the blessing at the moment of the miraculous event. There's actually nothing about that. It doesn't say you were saved by the lion, you say a prayer. The, the text is only about some other time when you happen upon that place or the next year or, that you remember. And that to me is a really interesting, says a lot about what the purpose of prayer is or a blessing is to mark the miracle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, there's, there's real power to that. The, the place where you experienced that becomes a place worthy of marking. Does anyone have one of those in their life?
Let's keep going. May I make a comment? Yeah. I think I think uh, a, a blessing is really an expression of gratitude. It's not that something happened, but that it's gratitude to God, a recognition and gratitude to God that it happened. Say that again. It, uh, a blessing is recognition of gratitude to God that it happened. Mm -hmm. Not just that it happened, but that God provided it. That God provided it, that there's something that intends that we didn't, or another human being. Yeah, that's nice. Let's take, keep looking as we, we go through the texts. Actually, can I tell one terrible joke, Rabbi Sherman? Always. It's the seventh night. I, you don't have to come back. You can boo me and you can just leave the meeting. Um, you can use this for your kids, Rabbi. So a, a man is walking in the woods and um, he's hiking and he sees a bear and the bear is getting closer and closer. And he's like, this is it. I'm going to die. Like, I cannot believe this giant grizzly bear is like right in front of me, looking at me. And uh, he had a, a food basket, which is just not smart, but the bear's close. And then suddenly the bear puts on a kippah and he says, oh, thank God. It's a Jewish bear. I'm going to be fine. And then he hears the bear say, Baruch hamotzi lechem min ha'aretz. Um, my kids used to like that when they were like seven years old. Um, my guess is that hiker didn't say a bracha. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. So let's take a look at brachot. There are blessings, we say, for miracles. In the prayer book, let's go down one more. Brachot 60b. Great. The Nisim B'choyom. Yeah. Excellent. Perfect. So in the prayer book, in the morning prayer, we do say these gratitude prayers for miracles. So miracle in Hebrew is Nes. Uh, we have that in the Hanukkah. Nes Gadol Hayasham, a great miracle happened there. Um, Nes is miracle. And in the prayer book, the plural is Nisim B'choyom, the miracles of everyday life. And we do say blessings, individual blessings. So it says, when one awakens, one recites, my God, the soul you have placed within me is pure. You formed it within me. You breathed it into me and you guard it while it is within me. One day you will take it from me and restore it within me in the time to come. As long as the soul is within me, I thank you. Oh, I deny my God and God of my ancestors, master of all worlds, Lord of all souls, blessed are you, Adonai, who restores souls to lifeless bodies. So this is the morning blessing. What is going on here? Is that a miracle? A person is out of um, consciousness, so they think of themselves as dead. And the spirit goes who knows where. Okay, so. Dreaming, but. You mean when you're sleeping? When you're sleeping, the person wakes up if they're a good sleeper and they, they feel like they've come alive again. Nice. And so so I think that, that sleep was kind of a, a near death experience. They, that's sleep. It was a little scary for them. And also the dreaming maybe is in there too. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be scary. Other thoughts? Why would you say a blessing? This would be a miracle. I see it as a gift. Mm. Not a miracle. All right. I'm going to argue maybe that they're connected somehow. Okay. 
because I think a gift by definition, but look, I'm thinking out loud with all of you, but this is how Jewish learning takes place. My sense is that gifts are better when they're unexpected. Meaning a gift that you expect, that you feel is coming to you, is more of an exchange. What do you think? I think that we don't, we can't take each day for granted. Right. But each day we wake up alive is a gift that we need to be thankful for. Yeah. I think there's an unexpected, if, if I want to say that I think miracles might be the unexpected, I think that's all wrapped up in that statement. If you expect to wake up every day, maybe you don't live with that sense of heightened awareness or gratitude. If you expect to get a TV for your birthday, That's I'm not sure it's as exciting. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah, Betty. I don't know how you can compare um, getting a TV to waking up every day. I mean, I think you just, I would, I expect to wake up every day. I, I'm not sure I think it's a miracle. I think it's more of a miracle when I can fall right asleep. But um, <laughs> I'm not sure um, my waking, I'm, I'm, I'm so happy to tell you the truth at this stage to wake up, take nourishment and be upright. But I'm not sure it's a miracle. I, I feel like it's more of just a, a fact of life. Rabbi, uh, let's go to the last text. I want to hear your thoughts on this one, Betty, along with everyone. Uh -huh. Then we'll complete it. I think that is necessary. Einstein, All the way at the, yeah, okay. I was always taught that he was a smart man. There are only two ways to live your life. One is as though nothing is a miracle. The other is as though everything is a miracle. Thoughts? Guess I cut you off, Betty. Any thoughts on that one? I, I don't. I just. I think. I. I think of a miracle as more of something startling, something that's just going to really like blow my socks off, or. Um, <laughs> I, like if I wake up. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I do think we oftentimes, you know, this is a very interesting discussion to me because I think oftentimes we use the word miracle very loosely and very lightly. Like, oh, you know, what a miracle I was able, you know, to do such and such. Well, it really wasn't a miracle. You put your mind to it and you did it. But um, so I'm not exactly sure for me right now, what a miracle is. <laughs> I guess it'll be a miracle if we're, if we're not in COVID anymore. That to me could be a big miracle and we could be together in the temple. But I, I also think that it's clear from the, at least the first Talmudic text that when it's a, when it's a miracle for the multitudes, it's mm -hmm. big enough that we all agree upon it. Yes. But also there seems to be something about the personal miracle is gonna be different for every person. Mm -hmm. And you have to just recognize that that's not something that I say about you or you say about me, but it's something that we own for ourselves. But let's think individually. I mean, you can live your life as it's miraculous or you can live it as though, no, I did that. I that really think, Rabbi, I, I really think that I remember my grandmother every morning um, saying a, a prayer uh, about, and I think we do it on Rosh Hashanah about that the opening should open and the closing should close. And, yeah. and, and really, I think she always felt that that miracle was not coming from her, that, that, that God or whatever you believe in is greater than yourself. And I think that that's, I mean, I know I'm a, I'm a prayer, so I very often say things like, 
oh, it's such a pretty day. It's such a beautiful day. Thank you so much for this beautiful day. I have that all day long. I, I don't know if it's because I feel it's a miracle or I just feel grateful that that is going on around me, anything. And I may, I really, I drive Henry and Heather crazy. All day long. <laughs> because I It's do, such a beautiful day outside. <laughs> I do feel overwhelmed with things that are out of my control that are there. And so maybe you call that individual miracles. I feel that way. I would say so. I would say so. Other thoughts? Could you read um, Albert Einstein's... Uh quote again, please. Philip, so you want to put that up? Visual learners. <laughs> there are only two ways to live your life. One is as though nothing is a miracle. The other is as though everything is a miracle. See, that bothers me because if everything is a miracle and it doesn't give any importance to, I don't know how to say, to what I don't know, but it, it makes everything the same as if nothing was a miracle. Almost. Other thoughts? Yeah. Well, um, the uh, the blessings that we were looking at before, the uh, morning blessings, which are sometimes in our prayer book at least called the Simba Kol Yom, the, the daily miracles, and it's, it's looking at things that we take as ordinary as if they were miracles, because really they are. It's uh, the first one is who gives sight to the blind. Uh, and we may not be blind, but we can kind of envision that we could be or that uh, humans could have been created without the ability to see and that it actually is something very special. And uh, you know, it goes through each of those uh, things that we take for granted that, that really, in a sense, are miracles. Yeah, I think, um, and we have to close soon, Taking for granted is the opposite of gratitude, the unexpected. Taking for granted is I expected to get this gift. I deserve this. I mean, this is what I'm, I, this is meant to be coming to me as opposed to unexpected is where did this come from? I can't believe you, you this came to me. I never expected this two very different ways of living. One is, I'm gonna survive this. I should survive this. Come on, pilot, do your thing. Thank you very much. At the end, I walked away. As opposed to, I'm not gonna survive this. Oh my gosh, I lived. Slightly different ways of perceiving reality. And I think for the rabbis is they're moving us on Hanukkah from human agency, from the Maccabees to the cruise of oil, to God saves. That even waking up, look, you gotta take care of yourself. There's certain level of human agency and survival. You can increase the odds a bit, but ultimately to really explore the sacred you got to give something to God. The notion of miracle appears. And so I think it's a little of both. But I think living with a sense of the unexpected and receiving things for free that you really didn't think were going to be coming to you is a pretty aware way of living. So maybe instead of leading with leaving with Einstein, we should leave with Heschel because he's the ultimate mystic that liked to put God at the center. He put God at the center so much that in the modern period, everyone had man in search of God, but Heschel flipped it to God in search of man was his book. He put God in the center. So here he goes. Among the many things that religious tradition holds in store for us, is a legacy of wonder. The surest way to suppress our ability to understand the meaning of God and the importance of worship is to take things for granted. Indifference to the sublime wonder of living is the root of sin. So with that, everybody, it's been great to learn with you, Rabbi Sherman. 
thanks for joining me. It's always fun. We don't get to do this enough. Absolutely. Join us on Monday night. We're going to, we're going to deepen miracles. I love Anyways. It. Banish the darkness. Yes. Tomorrow Alexa night. Mayach, everyone. Alexa Mayach, thank you. Thank you. Alexa Mayach. Thank you very much. Thank you.